have with us today Linda Evi, co-founder, CEO of Precisely.com. Prior to that, she was the co-founder of 23andMe and also involved in many genomic startups and personalized medicine startups in the last 15-20 years. She's also on the advisory board of Verily Life Sciences and also on the board of fellows Stanford Medical School. Hi Linda, how are you? I'm doing great, thank yes. you. Uh, I think we are talking of personalized medicine for the last decade or so and it looks like it became a reality in the next decade and especially with the whole genomic sequencing cost coming down to less than thousand dollars as on today and probably projected to come down to maybe less than hundred dollars uh, per sequencing in the next five years. Uh, so what do you think? Uh, uh, do you believe in what I'm saying? And also more important to set the context, uh, can you take the viewers through the technology behind it from genotyping to exome sequencing to whole genomic sequencing to start with? Well, it's great to be here, Dr. Ramesh. And I, I agree with you. I think we are headed toward uh, the $100 genome and not just a genome, but a genome at a depth that can give us clinical information, which is very exciting. Um, and we've seen this progression of the technology moving um, from genotyping, which was really the first way to look broadly across the genome. And it was the technology that was selected by the direct-to-consumer companies in the US, like 23andMe. Uh, we utilized that mostly because of cost. It was a kind of a poor man's way, if you will, of looking across the genome. And it provided very powerful and useful information. But it certainly is only acting as a proxy for full genome sequencing. And we saw the same thing with exome. The exome is really the parts of the genome that code and that, that really produce the products that our body needs. And when there are breaks in those genes, we have problems that are downstream in the, the proteins that are produced. But the problem with just looking at the exome is that it leaves out a lot of information. So it again was really a proxy for full gen genome sequencing which is where we are now today. We're finally at a point now where we can look at the whole genome. Why look at parts of it when we can get the whole thing? And that becomes very valuable information, especially in the day and age of precision health and, and personalized medicine, which is what we're hopefully gonna be moving toward. Mm -hmm. And if you want to put some numbers, for example, if whole genomic sequence is 100%, and what percentage of uh, information is sequenced in the genotyping, and what percentage of information is sequenced in exome sequencing? Well, genotyping is all about looking at these single point mutations, which are called SNPs. That's primarily what you're reading when you do genotyping. And it depends on the size of the chip that you're using. Some of them can look at 25,000 SNPs. They might look at half a million SNPs. You, you can design a chip with a number of those different SNPs on it. And the more you put on, the more information you get from a person's genome. The exome is still a very small part of the genome. Um, there's what they call junk DNA, which is an arguable term. Um, we think there's a lot of function going on outside of, the of these genes themselves. So exome sequencing is a small portion of the full genome. Um, whereas looking across the entire genome, you're looking at six billion points. There's three billion per strand. And if you're looking at both, you've got six billion points that you're measuring which again, thinking about that in terms of cost, if we're getting that down near $100, it's mind boggling. So your guess would be in the next five years, with the sequencing cost coming down to as low as $100, uh, people using just the genotyping and exome sequencing may go completely out of the way and all thing will be done will be the whole genomic sequencing? Potentially, yes. I think that could be where things go. I think for a while, genotyping will still be used. It's a very straightforward technology. And if you're only reading a few points in the genome, it's still a very affordable and, and, um, and very accurate way to read the genome. Uh, but with the cost coming down, it probably just makes sense to read everything and have all of that data available. Because then you do it once and you can go back and, and, and look at it again and again. But just to generate it one time is probably the most logical thing to do. I think that's great. The sequencing is one part. Uh, companies like Illumina, BGI, Oxford have done a fabulous job. Uh, the bioinformatics and counseling is other part. Uh, do you see enough expertise available in these areas or what do you feel are the challenges and opportunities uh, 
in this space? Well, I, I do believe there is a enormous opportunity for companies to develop technology to address both bioinformatics and the counseling side, actually. Um, we know that there are not enough genetic counselors in the world to handle this, this big flood of genetic information that is coming. Um, and so one of the things we've seen is um, development in the AI space and in chatbots and in ways of developing tech that can interact with people in a very intelligent way to give them very pertinent information about questions they have of their genetics. And um, it doesn't require a one-on-one -on -one with another human being because we know that that's not gonna be um, sustainable or it, we're not gonna have enough people to address that. So I think technology is going to be the way we answer that as well. So you've got genotyping technology and then we go to sequencing, that's moving forward very rapidly. But I think we're saying, seeing the same thing in the counseling side as well in the bioinformatics. Bioinformatics is a more straightforward way and it's easier to scale that, pro that part of the process. So yes, I think we're, we're seeing companies that are coming forward that are helping address those issues. Sure. I think we'll move away from technology to the clinical aspects. Uh, uh, it looks like that personalized medicine will become a reality, at least in the treatment of malignancies. Uh, a particular cancer, the particular genetic makeup may respond to certain drugs, may not respond to certain drugs. Uh, but in other areas of medicine, what do you feel uh, this personalized medicine is a myth that will always remain as a myth uh, or it will become a reality in the next at least 10 years in my lifetime? Well, I certainly hope it's not a myth and I've been following this space for a very long time. And I think we are starting to see uh, rapid developments now in the field of pharmacogenomics, which is the study of how our bodies respond to drugs. So the pharmaco part is a drug and then our genomics in that interaction. And it has a lot to do with how our bodies metabolize drugs. And humans are different, as we all know. And some people might do very well on a drug, whereas some people might have a very adverse reaction. And genetics can inform that. And so I think we're going to see a lot of development in that space. But then also in chronic disease, I think genetics could be very informative. Uh, we have these big labels that we use to describe a disease. But we know that there are subtypes of those conditions, and that could be why some people have different symptoms, some people progress very rapidly, some people progress slowly, and if we can start to implement genetics into chronic disease, I think that will also be very helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe, you know, I'm a cardiologist. Uh, uh, right now, all the cardiovascular drugs being marketed and sold in this country have been, uh, uh, have been approved in the United States that 99.9% .9 of those patients who participate in the clinical trials are from the Western part of the world. But the same data is being used in Indian, in the, by the Indian companies to get the regulatory approvals and we are using in this country. The question always is in our minds, a drug which is approved in the US has been tested in the US population or European population or Japanese population, will it work in India? The question to you is, assuming I have the genomic sequencing of my patients, and is it possible to say if this drug will work, will not drug, or these have to be tested the next five years, 10 years, the genomic sequencing of the Indian population, as well as see which drugs. I know certain drugs, we can say, look, for example, clopidogrel, for example, it works in certain patients, it doesn't work in certain patients, but common drugs like hypertension, do you think even there there's a possibility, depending upon your genotypic, uh, your genomic, uh, 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 the set of data you inherited, will drugs response be different? Well, I think the good news is, is that because a lot of work has been done in other populations, we have a basis of knowledge to work with. So the first thing we can do is take those markers that were discovered in other populations and test them in the Indian population. So the, the process will be a lot faster to validate what has been learned in other parts of the world and see whether it fits with the Indian population. There may be tweaks that have to be done and there might be additional. You are saying some new associations may, may turn come out, may yeah, come out. And this is another reason why getting full genome sequencing is very valuable because now we can also look for new variants. Mm -hmm. But I believe that we'll, we won't have to start from square one. I think we've got a, a great body of knowledge to start working with and then validate that in India and then fine tune it for the Indian population. So I think it's going to be a much shorter process than it was in the Western world. Uh, I see a lot of reports uh, using genomics to say what to eat, what not to eat. Are we stretching the field of genomics too wide or you still feel 
based upon your genomics, certain food may be good for you, may not be good for you? Well, I would love to think that those are highly accurate predictions, but I have to say I'm quite skeptical at this point of how valuable that information is at the genetics level of being able to predict the breakdown of, and I've seen some of these companies that say you should eat certain levels of carbs and proteins, and frankly, I, I don't think we're quite there yet, but we may get better at that, but uh, I think there is a lot of work to be done and a lot of research that we still have to do. Linda, in many countries like India, we hardly have genomics uh, information, maybe 100,000, maybe not even 100,000 people, maybe 10,000 people's data is available. Uh, so when you're creating solutions for countries like India, is it possible to extrapolate the data from the West or you need to build your own large databases in countries like India before the prediction engines can be as accurate as what you see in the Western population? I think it's somewhere in the middle. I believe that there is a lot of data to extrapolate from and to test in the Indian population. So it gives you a, a, a better starting point than starting at square one. And if you can take those data points that we've discovered in other populations, do the validation, and then, but because you're looking at the whole genome, you might be able to find some new markers that are specific to India. I think that will be very valuable. And at some point, because the costs are dropping so much on sequencing, I think it's inevitable that most people will be sequenced in the future. And then you will then very accurately be able to prescribe medicines for people. You'll be able to understand their disease condition at their level. And we will truly get to an age of precision health. Uh, so I, I do believe that that comes from each individual having access to their own data. On the flip side, do you see anything uh, bad which can come out of the genomics research? For example, you've seen instances like that in some of the new technologies like stem cells. Uh, do you see a possibility of some, I, won't, I should not use the word rogue nations or rogue startups, but do you see the flip side of assuming a country has millions and millions of people's genomic data, is there a possibility that instead of being put to good use like predicting diseases or preventing diseases, this information can be used for certain unforeseen situations or, or conditions? Well, it's, it's like most things in life. There are, there are good intentions and bad intentions, and it's not the technology or the data that's the problem. It's the uses that um, some people might try. Uh, and so I think that this is something that as societies, we need to keep a handle on what the uses are and how the data are um, directed at certain populations, potentially, that could be discriminatory. I think we have to be very careful about that. Um, but I don't think it's the technology itself that is the problem. Uh, I think it's very exciting and I, I tend to be an optimist uh, that, that we have so much benefit we can bring to people through the data. Um, but there are offshoots also to genomic data. For instance, how we can edit the genome through other technology where we can go in and make changes to a, a human genome. Uh, I think that's an area we especially have to be careful about. Uh, it's one thing to read the genome. It's quite another to go in and, and make edits to it. And we don't know always what the outcomes are going to be with that. Um, so that's another area that I think uh, worldwide ethicists are paying very close attention to. I think that's very important. Uh, all the while we are concentrating on the genomics, the study of genome. How do you study the genome? But far more important is tomorrow, the gene editing or the CRISPR technologies where people probably things can go wrong if they fall into wrong hands. Uh, yeah. yes. And probably governments and the medical bodies have to evolve certain regulatory, uh, I would say barriers or a boundary where people cannot cross. Uh, Exactly. And hopefully there will be a global conversation around that because I think there are um, so many benefits. We don't want to lose the opportunity to take advantage of the positive outcomes because there are some bad players. So I think we have to keep a balance when reviewing this and when having conversations about it. Yeah, Linda, we covered, I think, a reasonable uh, uh, areas of genomics, especially on the diagnostic side. Which are the top three genomic startups or initiatives you admire in the world? And if so, why? Well, of course, the, the technology companies that have actually created this ability to read the genome, like Illumina, and uh, like a company actually called Complete Genomics that was also based in California. Uh, they, had, they were very early in their strategy of how they were going about um, genetic testing and, and sequencing. 
Um, and so I, I, it's the technology companies that have enabled now so many incredible initiatives across the globe. Uh, Genomics England is, I think, a, a very admirable project. The, the British government is really putting a lot of funding behind sequencing the, uh, the genomics of, of Brits, and I think that's going to advance things a lot. They've already created a lot of data that's been insanely useful. Um, and I think we'll see more governments stepping in. I think Thailand is actually doing some interesting work, as well as Taiwan. Um, and so I think more, the more the governments can step in and, and do the work and support this, the better. Uh, I think there will be interesting things coming out of the U.S. actually through the NIH. Uh, they have a project called All of Us, and it's similar to the U.K. where they're doing a lot of sequencing of patients, but they're also taking the data from medical records and merging that all together. So I would say that it's been very impressive to see what the governments are actually doing in the space. Fabulous. Is it the same thing which is happening in Scripps Clinic? The project which you're referring to in the US? Uh, or these are different projects? Scripps, Scripps is involved in all sure. of us, yes. Sure. They have, they've um, created centers of excellence throughout mm -hmm. the country. And so they have certain focuses that they, um, they fund. And Scripps is one of the, the institutes sure. that, that has gotten that funding. So what are the big pharma are doing? Are they completely out of the space or they're doing a lot of work in-house or they're getting into space by acquisitions? Uh, yeah, I think it's a combination. Uh, we're seeing some pharmas that decide they want to do things in-house, but I think they also realize that it's um, sometimes easier to do partnerships. Uh, so for instance, GSK did a very large uh, investment in 23andMe. Uh, $300 million was put into the company um, and there's a data sharing uh, component of that partnership. So I think pharmas are very good at recognizing what they don't do well in-house and that they can look outside and bring a lot of funding to companies that are looking for those types of, of partnerships. Another interesting development a few years ago was where Amgen bought Decode, mm -hmm. which was the Icelandic genomics company. Um, so very clearly Amgen wanted to bring it in-house through an acquisition. Um, and I think we'll con continue to see those kinds of partnerships and uh, pharma looking for more genetic information rather than less, and uh, particularly in pharmacogenetics. I think they're very interested in targeting drugs to people um, where it works and where it's, it, there's more efficacy. Uh, I think we see this happening in the U.S. where the insurance companies are going to require uh, value-based pricing. They're only going to reimburse in patients where the, they have a better sense that the drug will work. So because that's on the horizon, the farmers are getting more involved in creating the genetic data along with uh, the clinical trials that are going on. I think, uh, fabulous, Linda. A final question to you. You are on the advisory board of Verily Life Sciences. Uh, can you give us, the our viewers, our audience, uh, what are the real interesting things happening inside Verily Life Sciences? I know certain aspects will be confidential, but definitely uh, I'm sure certain things are in public domain where you can disclose. That would be great to end the story. Yeah, it's, an, it's a very exciting company. I'm so thrilled to be on the advisory board because we do get to hear all of the exciting things that they have um, in their docket. They're, they, the sky is the limit with them, which is very exciting. Of course, people may know that they are the life sciences um, affiliate with Google. So they started out with a lot of funding and they've been very involved actually with the NIH, with the All of Us project. So that's one thing that they've contributed a vast amount of data. They're developing all kinds of wearables for uh, ways of tracking um, human, the human body. I find those always very fascinating. Uh, and, and one of the projects that is so cool, I think, is their mosquito eradication program. Mm -hmm. uh, as we know, mosquitoes transmit a lot of disease. And if we, would, if we could somehow stop that in its tracks, uh, I think it would have huge implications for places like India, where it's a huge problem with, pro with malaria and dengue fever. Um, so being able to go in and, and deal with the, the vector, if you will, the mosquito, I think is a very exciting possibility. So um, it's, it's, it's a very crazy but very exciting place to be at Verily. And um, they're, they're, What happens there? Do you change the gene sequence of a mosquito so that it doesn't replicate or something like that? Yeah, it's, it's along those lines where they do very fine tuning of the, the genetic sequence. I think of only the male mosquitoes, if I'm not mistaken. And so they're able to go in and, and um, pretty much stop the development of any new mosquitoes. Um, so it's a, um, 
and you know, of course, there are always unintended consequences, but I think they're being very careful doing the research on islands, so mm -hmm. they keep it isolated uh, wow. while they figure out what are the, the downstream effects of, of uh, removing a, a species like this from the ecosystem. So it's, um, but they, you know, they have a lot of resources. They have a lot of very, very smart people there. And um, I think you're gonna see some very exciting. Oh, that's fabulous to hear that. Uh, yeah. Uh, thanks, Linda, uh, for coming over to uh, NDS office in Hyderabad and uh, taking us uh, through a journey of last 20 years in genomics. Uh, and your excitement to still work in the genomic space for the next uh, 10 years, at least in this country, uh, especially. And I think uh, we're very fortunate to have you in our office. Uh, 